Thank you so much for joining this evening's Insights Talk. Uh, my name is Janelle Hazard, and I am the new Executive Director and Curator at Greater Western Art Center. Um, I'm honored to be joining the team and um, to graciously take the, the leadership from uh, Lily Siegel. And it's been absolutely thrill thrilling to lead this organization to its next chapter. Um, we are excited to be premiering our second virtual programming um, program this evening. Last week we had an artist talk with Christopher Carnavicus, who is the guest curator of the Velocity of a Page exhibition, which we are here to celebrate this evening. Um, it was a fantastic talk. We learned a lot about the, the book as a place, as an object, as a space, and we are excited to continue that conversation this evening. Um, to provide a little bit of a background, the Velocity of a Page exhibition is a virtual multi-platform exhibition where guest curator Christopher Carnabigas hand-selected works to appear on both our website and our social media platforms. So if you, you haven't checked it out, please be sure to visit our website. Um, please visit our Instagram where we're releasing new, fresh content each day. And um, we are especially thankful to Christopher and the artist for helping us convert this show to an online format. Um, I'd like to, to thank our sponsors. So Reston Community Center um, is a longtime local partner and we're so very thankful for them for helping us to make these programs happen. I also want to thank our board members. I see Robert Gowdy, our board chair, just wrote in the chat that he is here with his family. Robert, thanks so much for joining us. Um, do we have any other board members present this evening? I see Janet. Janet, thanks for joining again. Um, let me see if I'm missing anyone else. I think I saw Dan. Hi, Dan. I think that's everyone. Let me know if I if I missed you. Um, without further ado, I won't take too long to talk. I'll go ahead and pass the, the mic to Sarah Behrens, our education manager, to lead us into the program this evening. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Janelle. Um, so welcome and thank you to everyone joining us for this evening's Insights Talk. Before I introduce the program and our speaker, Sarah Osborne Bender, I just wanna go over a few general housekeeping notes for this evening's talk. These were all points that you received in the email with tonight's Zoom link. So if you've read over those, um, you'll know what I'm about to say. Uh, upon entering this Zoom meeting, you should have been automatically muted. And we do kindly request that you keep your microphone off during the presentation to help us facilitate a clear presentation between event speakers. And although your audio will be turned off, we would still love to see you. So if you have a camera and are comfortable with this option, please do keep your video on. Um, during the presentation, we encourage you to type any questions that you might have um, for the speaker into the chat feature, which can be found at the bottom toolbar of the Zoom room. And at the end of the talk, we will open it up for a question and answer session by reading those questions submitted. So you can also use the raise hand feature and we can call on you to unmute yourself and ask your question directly to Sarah. This event will be recorded. We are recording now. So if you would not like to be included in the recording but wish to listen to the talk, simply keep your microphone and camera turned off for the duration of the event. All right, so introducing this program, the Insights program is designed to bring curators and other academics from major institutions to rest in to discuss the work on view at Grace. In this case, we are bringing the talk to you virtually. This evening's event is the second virtual public program that we are hosting for the virtual, uh, for the ver Velocity of a Page exhibition, as Janelle just mentioned. Um, and we do have another one next week, Thursday, May 21st at 6 p.m. Um, we will host our creative response then with artist Rex Delafkaran. So if you're interested in attending this, please send an email to info at restinarts.org as you did to obtain the Zoom login information for tonight's event. And again, all of these programs are free to attend thanks to the support of Reston Community Center. So our speaker for this evening is Sarah Osborne Bender, who is the head of library technical services at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. 
in her position there and previously as director of the Betty Boyd uh, Dieter Library and Research Center at the National Museum of Women in the Arts, she has helped develop important collections of book arts through meaningful acquisitions. Her favorite method for sharing artists' books is to put them literally in people's hands. Using exhibitions, public programs, and personal interact interactions, Sarah demystifies this fluid form and makes meaningful connections with the visual, literary, and tactile elements of artists' books. In addition to over 20 years experience in art and museum libraries, she has a background in studio arts and writing. So welcome, Sarah, I'll pass it on to you. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm really honored to be here and talk about the velocity of a page uh, curated by Christopher Cardin Bikas. And uh, thanks for joining us. Um, so as introduced, I'm, I'm an art museum librarian at the National Gallery of Art. And I, I work with my colleagues to uh, build and develop and share an amazing collection of artist books, um, which is just one of the um, really strong collections of artist books in the DMV. So I'm going to share my screen so we can look at some pictures together. And let's see, did that do it? Hold on. Almost. While Sarah's pulling up her presentation, I just want to reiterate uh, Sarah Barron's uh, comment about using the chat throughout the evening. Um, Sarah Osborne Bender, we have two Sarahs here this evening, she is very um, open to taking questions throughout the presentation. So we'll, do, we'll be doing a combination of addressing questions during and after the presentation. So please feel free to use your chat box. Thank you. All right, so um, if everybody can see my my picture there. Um, so this, this is an image of the display cases in the uh, library at the National Gallery of Art. This was shot not too long before we were, we were all sent home. <laughs> and this is um, the planning layout for an artist book exhibition that was to open uh, last Monday, actually. Um, and I think it's gonna open in May, 2021. Um, but, you know, I've, I've worked in um, art museum libraries for almost my whole career and artist books are always kind of lurking around the edges of the collections where I work. And I have to admit that I, I, didn't, I didn't really get them for a long time. It, it took me a while. And, and now some of the most rewarding experiences that I've had have been around sharing artist books with people. Um, and my focus on them really grew during my time at the Betty Boyd Dietrich Library and Research Center at the National Museum of Women and Arts, which is in Washington, D.C. Uh, so this is, a, this is an image of the reading room uh, there at the, at the Women's Museum. Uh, and the collection of artist books uh, at, at the Women's Museum is um, known around the world. Uh, people come to the museum uh, just to come up to the library and see artist books. You can see them arranged throughout the room there. Um, the library was started by Christina Wasserman, who was the, the museum's founding librarian and the uh, artist books curator emerita. And I learned a lot from her about building relationships with artists, um, the depth of the field, and about the rewards of sharing artist books. Um, in the Women's Museum collection, um, we had a book that was housed in a pie tin. Um, that is uh, Emily Martin's Eight Slices of Pie. Um, looks very whimsical. Uh, it's actually something that she made in the aftermath of September 11th when she was really thinking about um, objects of comfort. Um, we had a book that, let's see. We had a book that uh, had been covered with breading and baked in the oven. Uh, this is uh, by Denise Aubertin. It's uh, called Shakespeare Hamlet. Um, Aubertin began making artist books uh, in the late 60s and she took a lot of inspiration from uh, Dieter Roth, who uh, was an artist that um, is sometimes credited with making some of the earliest artist books. He also did a fair amount of uh, work with food. So Aubertin would, would make, um, a specific recipe for these Western classics. She would use flour or polenta or cloves or ginger or peppers, and she would actually coat the book, bake it in the oven, 
and really highlight the, the objectness of the book, but render it, uh, you know, intellectually useless. Um, and it, it's in this plexi box, which always made me very nervous because uh, I was always afraid that it was going to knock a certain way and the breading was all going to fall off. But <laughs> it was definitely uh, a, a popular piece. Um, we also had a, a book made with giant bird wings and um, hair from a horse's tail. Uh, this is called For the Birds. It's by uh, Carrie McKeeler Keeler, who um, some of you or many of you may know uh, from her um, huge profile in the book arts world, especially in DC uh, at the Corcoran and then at George Washington University. So as I said, people came specifically to see artist books on display and I, I gave plenty of uh, talks and walked people by cases and pointed at and described materials and construction and movement. But really the best exchanges that I had um, with visitors um, was with a rotating a selection of artist books that uh, I kept up at the reference desk at the counter. Um, and I really encouraged people to pick them up and flip through them. And one of the books uh, that I shared a lot was by Alex Costu, and it's, it's a total coincidence that this book is also in this exhibition. <laughs> um, it was one of the first things that, uh, that, I, that I thought about when I was thinking, uh, you know, so what will I talk about during this talk? And, and then I, I found it on the checklist here. So uh, I, I think I bought this from Alex, maybe at the Small Press Expo. Uh, it's called, Are You Even Listening? Um, from 2015. And it's a, it's a risograph print. Um, it's got those characteristic ink colors of that printing method. Um, it's an abstract, wordless comic, and it's a spiral accordion fold. So the book really tumbles through the reader's hands as they read it. And so I would present this to someone, and when they were done moving through the piece, uh, I would sort of gently unfurl the book until it was, once again, as it had started, which is a flat sheet of cardstock um, that just has a spiral cut and some simple folds, but what it creates is this meandering path from start to finish. And it's really just that simple paper engineering, um, the simplicity and the immediacy of the action. I mean, it's paper, it's cut, it's folded, um, but the engagement with people was, was always very, very evident. So this exhibition, uh, The Velocity of a Page, is expansive in its embrace and its definition of artist books. Um, I joked with Christopher that uh, in an email that my goal when I talk about artist books is to always stay away from the definition of artist books. <laughs> um, so what you see here is a definition of, from the um, Getty Art and Architecture Thesaurus of what is the artist book. This is the definition that um, uh, art librarians or museum registrars would use. Um, and you can see it's kind of a complicated thing to, uh, to define. But if you've looked at this exhibition online, um, I would say that you, you've seen the definition of artist books. I mean, they are, they are complex, they're unique, they're democratic, they're lowbrow, they're fine press, they're personal, they're political, um, universal, expensive, precious, strange, poetic. I mean, it, it's, um, it, it, is all encompassing. Um, so I'm gonna start this journey through the exhibition um, with a long answer to a question. Um, when I was doing research for the artist books exhibition that you saw the slide for um, in the first slide, um, I was doing a lot of reading about the work of Ronnie Horn, uh, who is an artist that works in a lot of media. She does uh, drawing and sculpture and photography, but she always, uh, or she, she really spends a lot of time coming back to the book form. And in my research, I found this interview from 1994, um, Horn speaking to the curator Jan Howard for a Feta monograph. And I think that Horn's answer to the question, what is your interest? in the book form um, is a, a really excellent way to touch on much of what is beloved and important about artist books and about the books in this exhibition. So we're gonna go to this quote. It's a long quote, but stick with me because I, I think it's excellent. Um, so here's a picture of uh, Horn on the left here. So she says, um, first, 
The book is a, a unique manner of address. Of great importance is the fact that the book is an intimate form. It mostly engages the individual individually, and I can think of no other form so inherently private. Second, the individual must be active in the exchange, not simply encountering or locating a given book, but in consuming it. And in this sense, the book chooses its audience. It was a circumscribed appeal. Third, reading or looking at a book offers a peculiar analog, both to lived experience and to the experience of landscape. Sequential relations, mostly cumulative and irreversible, order them. Fourth, and for me of special importance, a book is not a simple object within its particular identity. It harbors the path of its assimilation into society. A book is distributed. As a mass produced portable object that is financially accessible, the book goes out into the world, ultimately locating itself where it's most desired. And fifth, and very close to this idea of distribution is the ubiquity and reach of a book. Its portable nature allows the book practical, physical transit to virtually any place in the world. So although the book may wind up where it's most desired, there are no limits to the location of that desire. So we're gonna walk through uh, selections from the exhibition and I'm gonna use Ronnie Horn's five part quote as sort of our our compass through the, the selection. There are so many great uh, works in this exhibition and it's, it's big and I'm sorry that we can't all sort of walk through it together. So I've made a selection um, that, we can, that we can share. So first we'll work with this idea of the artist book as, as intimate and as inherently private. Uh, this idea for me was, was very visceral. So it sort of conjures the idea of like, the book in hands or the book, you know, a small book in a coat pocket or um, the message that the page has only for its reader. And um, looking at uh, Leah Mackin's uh, Glitch uh, book, uh, I really had that sense. Uh, I mean, first of all, just the scale that you see here in these images, um, which uh, are so helpfully shot, you know, held in the hand. Um, you, can, you can see something of a sequencing. Um, you've got that perfect uh, binding that's familiar. Um, I believe this is a photocopy book that she, uh, that she did and that the pages are all abstract images. So the visual narrative is very particular to the reader. Um, Leah said in the opening event last week that she's very interested in the book as a printy object uh, of the ink on paper. And um, that, you know, this is, this is the process uh, that you see here, even though the means were achieved through, uh, through a photocopier. I also thought that um, Mary and Deja's uh, work really um, rang true with this, this intimate uh, idea of artist books. Uh, she has two works uh, in this show that I'm gonna show, that I'm gonna um, feature here, uh, one called Static and one called Poems for Passing Ships uh, that really draw on the, the idea of the intimate exchange. Uh, the text in her book Static is recalling a dream. Um, she has this very vivid description and uh, her description of the dream ends with the sentence, and everything is static. Um, and then the word static appears alone um, for the remainder of the book's pages. And the way that she uses the repetition of the word in the same font sort of stamped across these abstract fields, it has this very direct messaging to the reader and it shares this, this ominous sense from the dream. Uh, Poems for Passing Ships also uses dreams for the letterpress set text. And to me, it, it seems like it reads this sort of, sort of whispered and strange. Um, and there are these, these sort of untethered blocky shapes uh, on many of the pages uh, that accompany the text. And those are um, made by printing with the backs of wood type. And I also want to talk again about Alex Costu. Uh, so uh, uh, another one of the works uh, by uh, her that's in this exhibition um, is called uh, Enchiridion. Um, I admit I had to look up that word. It was new to me. Um, and it, it means uh, a handbook or a manual. So 
Um, this book is uh, Costu's uh, handbook to the actor Kate Blanchett, um, and I believe it is her birthday today. Um, so the, it's, it's a handbook to the actor that occupies this very sort of metaphysical space that indicates that Blanchett is some kind of a, like a transcendent alpha and omega kind of oracle or keystone. And it's a very wonderful sci-fi comic. Um, and the tone and the design and the color and the line, it's all very um, earnest. And it gives you this sense that you're being sort of let in on, on some very secret information. Um, there are these little fold outs as you move through the book um, that impart even more information. Some of it seems to be sort of coded. So this book is definitely an intimate transmission to the reader. Um, the second, second part of the quote, uh, it talks about the book um, as an exchange, uh, as the individual being active in the exchange and the consuming of the book. Um, thinking about the word consuming uh, in, in the realm of artist books in particular, my mind really went to sort of the, the manual manipulation of some kinds of artist books and, and certainly artist multiples, which is, uh, which is a, a form of artist books or sort of adjacent to artist books. And, and some, some of the books here are like multiples and, and have sort of a kit element to them. Uh, I'm in Um, I was really drawn to this. Um, she uh, created or sort of recreated in like a mind-blowing edition of 52, uh, what is described on her website as an artist facsimile of an educational uh, film strip kit. Um, the elements of this uh, kit that had initially been plastic are here actually created out of paper. So like the plastic of the cassettes and the plastic of the film canister, or yeah, the film strip canisters. Uh, there's also a booklet included here that's printed with letterpress. Um, the receipt, which you might be able to uh, look at closely is, um, I mean, it's right on. It's like discolored and kind of faded. Um, the perforations and the dot matrix sprockets were added to the paper. Um, so it's, it's a remarkable uh, object. And I also want to note here that this book was published by the Women's Studio Workshop, uh, which is located in upstate New York. And they've been around since uh, 1974, and they've supported a really long lineage of strong work in the artist book field. Um, I also uh, looked at uh, Mika Horabuchi's Invitation to an Image from Candor Arts, uh, operating sort of in the, in the area of artist multiples. Um, Candor Arts is based in Chicago and works with artists to produce editions of, uh, of books and they're represented by four works in this exhibition. Um, for invitation to an image, um, Horobuchi designed this handmade box. Uh, there's foil stamp lettering on the top. Uh, inside there's a, a sketchbook, um, these rubber stamps that the artist made. Uh, and there's a graphite uh, pencil included too. So, I mean, this is truly embodying the idea that the book is consumed by the individual um, using the sketchbook, using the pencil and the stamps. Um, the individual is, uh, is active to carry out the purpose of this book. Uh, and I also, um, thought about Katana Lippert's um, Memories Undone. Uh, this book form is called a mix and match book. Um, you might have encountered them when you were a child. Um, you do see them in, in artist books pretty frequently. It's um, sort of akin to like an exquisite corpse type of exercise. Um, the strips can be um, recombined um, to change the image uh, or change the narrative experience. There's a high number of possible combinations um, from what I could tell from uh, Katana's website, it looked like possibly this book was part of, uh, of an installation, um, but the, the imagery and the color and the, the movement um, of the strips, I think is very beautiful. Um, Sarah Halsey's work, um, which stems from her background in linguistics. Um, these books 
sort of propose to deliver some kind of decrypted or essential information in the exchange with the reader. Um, the book's graphics are very structured, um, which lines up with her description of her linguistics research, being interested in the structures of language. Um, so there, she has two books in this exhibition. One is a universal lexicon and uh, asterisms. They both seek to kind of decode and assist the individual in understanding complex concepts. Um, this one here called asterisms, um, it's, it's quite technical and it draws on relationships between constellations and visualizations of phonemes from the world's most spoken languages. And a universal lexicon um, provides um, not only English translations from the Italian writings of Galileo, it's also providing um, illustration that, um, that, that attempts to provide the reader with an understanding of the whole universe. Um, and both books are very cerebral in their subject matter, but these clean graphic elements that are um, uh, made with uh, letterpress and engraving and woodcut, um, they're very engaging and a, a beautiful counterpart to the very cerebral content. And a, a different angle on this idea of exchange um, can be seen in this, this really fascinating project from um, Florida State University. Uh, their small craft advisory press uh, has a, um, a, recur a, a publication series called Oyster Boat. And there are, um, there's so far one volume with four issues uh, of Oyster Boat and two of the issues are included in the exhibition here. And the idea behind Oyster Boat is that um, artists send uh, uh, sort of cast off materials, detritus left over from, from their process. Um, and, and each issue is a collaboration between an artist and the press. Um, so it really begins with a literal exchange of material. So, um, you know, I'm not really spotlighting as much the exchange between the book and the reader, but certainly the exchange between artists and the exchange between artists and publisher. Um, so this concept of exchange actually exists through quite a number of the works uh, in this show where you have um, publishers working with artists, artists as publishers. Um, so this third part of the quote, um, you know, we're gonna talk about the idea of, of order. Um, of sequential relations, uh, which Horn describes as mostly cumulative and, and irreversible. Uh, and the books in this exhibition um, that are from the tradition of comics and wordless books um, really rely on, on order, um, more of a traditional narrative order. Um, and two of them really um, stood out to me in particular. Um, Perfectly Acceptable Press is a risograph uh, printing um, uh, publisher uh, based in Chicago, uh, started by Matt Davis. Um, he started publishing the work of um, cartoonists and illustrators after he stopped drawing his own work. Uh, and the press has printed two issues of Grip Comic uh, by Lael Westvend and Grip 2 is included in this exhibition. Um, I found the imagery in this to be so strong, it really stuck with me. Um, the protagonist of Grip is a woman uh, with very powerful hands, and the way that that's communicated and emphasized by these radiating lines and the color and the scale within the frame is very, um, is fantastic. Uh, the colors, uh, the selected colors, to me it was very like Bazooka Joe comic, I don't know <laughs> anybody else sees that, but um, I, maybe that gave it like a, a comfort, like familiar comfort level too. Um, but I just, I think the density and the incredible amount of action um, captured in these images is really, is powerful, just like the hands of the protagonist in the comic. Um, Pelinar Press. Um, I've seen Pelinar Press at a number of um, artist book fairs and zine fests. Um, I always stop at their table. This is a, it's a Baltimore based um, press established in 2004 and it's run by um, Ursula West Minervi and Jonathan Palazuk. Um, they have a lot of uh, woodcut work, uh, letterpress. It always stands out to me at book fairs. There's a long and rich tradition of um, 
wordless books uh, told through woodcuts, uh, really going back to like the 20s. Um, uh, the artist Lynn Ward or um, this woman, Helena, uh, I have to write her name down or I'll butcher it, Botrakova Ditrakova. Um, she did uh, novels and uh, travelogues um, told it through woodcut. Uh, and I always think of their work when I see um, Pelinor Press. Uh, so Jonathan Polizuk's Ritual, uh, which you see here, um, it just has this really bold beauty uh, using woodcut and the single color, the high contrast images, um, telling a story without words. And the paper engineering here uh, gives the work just literal depth. Again, it's, it's simple cut and fold, um, but it generates a considerable physical presence for this work. And I'm going to combine these, these last two because I think they're so closely intertwined, but just um, talking about the elements of um, books being distributed and a book's reach. Um, the idea that a book goes out into the world, that it has a path into the society, and that the book has the ability to reach anywhere. Um, during the opening event for this exhibition last week, there was uh, some really meaningful conversation around the motivation of these artists and artists as publishers to get works out there, to get stories and images and works into people's hands. And that's, that's certainly the core of, uh, of the zine world and the idea of distribution. And I can't recall if it was Kyle Quinn or um, Julia um, Arredondo who said it, but they said that the one-to-one -one distribution is, is the way to do it. So um, I think that the, the publishers that fall into the zine um, area in this exhibition, I think fit with these, these last uh, parts of Horn's quote. Um, Homey House Press uh, was started by Adriana Monsalve when she was living in Laredo, Texas. And now I think she's based uh, in the DMV and uh, her collaborator uh, is Katerina Rog, who is based in Italy. So they've got, a, they've got um, um, you know, disparate backgrounds and a broad um, international reach. And their press works um, chiefly with photo books. Uh, and their collaborations with writers and photographers and artists. There's, there's a strong storytelling element in all of them. Um, they really emphasize minority and diverse voices and all their publications are united by a really bold use of color um, and very clean construction. Um, I acquired one of their early books called I Used to Live Here um, for the um, women, Women's Museum uh, zine collection. Um, so uh, selected for this exhibition, there's this book here called uh, Self Ser, which is um, about the, oops, sorry. Yeah, uh, it's a, it's sort of a poetry chapbook uh, combined with a photo book. Uh, and you can see examples of some of the really gorgeous photography here. Um, and then there's this, uh, this book called Little Black Book, um, which is about the experience of a, um, a Ghanaian uh, born and raised in Italy. Um, so again, these, these, uh, these voices uh, that you wouldn't typically um, hear from. Um, the work of Julia Arredondo, um, I really enjoyed hearing from her in the event last week. Um, the zines are just a sliver of the work that she produces. She said last week that uh, being an entrepreneur is part of her practice and that she loves to start new businesses. Um, she is all about uh, distribution and reach uh, in the widest variety of ways. Uh, anything from zines to um, artist residency as performance. Uh, and she has uh, a media channel where she sells her, her zine work. Um, I was familiar with her through her zines, um, Baltimore Breakups and The Guide to Dating Gangsters Volume 2, um, both of which are in the zine collection at the Women's Museum. Um, uh, really, really great, bold, graphic work with a lot of personality in them, which you can see, I think, in these two. Uh, so I'm going to kind of close my talk here with uh, images, <laughs> images of things we might not be able to do for a while. Um, this, is a, this is sort of a, a panorama of the New York Art Book Fair. Um, 
I think this is maybe from 2016. Um, if you haven't attended, this gives you a sense of, of where a lot of book arts uh, make, their, make their way from artists and publishers to, um, to collectors, to curators, to librarians. Um, they're, they're a paradise for book people. Um, they're, they're packed uh, and they're fun. And uh, here on the left is an image uh, from the National Museum of Women in the Arts, the DC Art Book Fair, uh, which was held there in their second year in 2017. Um, and again, you can see, you know, every, every artist and publisher has their own table. The table has its own personality. You know, you get to talk to, you get to talk to the makers, you get to talk to the publishers. Um, um, it's, it's a, it's a great way to collect art. It's a great way to get to know artists. Um, uh, it's a good sense of community. And on the right is just a, a exhibition of artist books uh, in a case. So. Um, I, I just uh, hope that after we've sort of gone through this now that you, if you didn't have a sense of artist books before, um, maybe that you um, feel like you know a little bit more about this form and that you feel like you got to inhabit Christopher's exhibition for a little while. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to take questions um, and perhaps Christopher could chime in if there are any questions for him. And I think we have some of the artists from the exhibition on as well. So I'll yeah, at this point. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was really interesting. Um, I, we do have quite a bit of the artists. I think I've counted at least seven or eight here with us this evening, so that's exciting. Um, I definitely encourage everyone to begin dropping your questions into the chat. We have about 15, 20 minutes to spend where those questions can go to Sarah, they can go to Christopher. Um, I definitely would love to hear from some of the artists who are here and their take on, on what Sarah has presented this evening. And I think first, before I actually begin taking questions, I would love to hear from Christopher um, and what, you, what your thoughts were on Sarah's perspective. I'm gonna unmute you. I think we're doing it at the same time. <laughs> Hi, Christopher. Hi, yeah. So. Uh, first, thanks everyone again for joining us tonight. Um, and Sarah, thank you so much for, for participating in this and putting together this really wonderful presentation. Um, I absolutely love the Ronnie Horn quote and her discussion of what a book is and why it's such a powerful object and how you use that as the way to reorganize the show and recategorize things. Um, so it was great to see that as another, like, overlay on top of the, the books that were that were presented. And there's uh, so many books that are part of the exhibit. So I'm sure it's really hard to even like narrow things down. Um, and I'm wondering if there is anything that was particularly, particularly surprising to you, uh, a book that you had not seen before that really like stuck out for you because you see so many artist books and so many zines at the institutions that you've worked in. Um, I think that it is kind of a, a magical moment when you do see something that is truly surprising in, in book arts and zines when you've been working with them for so long. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think one thing that I've really enjoyed over the last, um, I don't know, I'm just gonna, this is maybe arbitrary, maybe last five years or so, is the embrace of zines and comics into the artist book world. I mean, I think, I think what I had been uh, encountering for the most part um, were more of your sort of grand sculptural, um, very, very small edition um, uh, artist books and uh, I mean, I, they're fascinating and they certainly have their place, but what I, what I really enjoyed about collecting um, zines and comics in particular, uh, and sort of goes back to part of um, Horn's quote was how accessible they were. So, you know, one thing that I would always do is I, I would always buy two <laughs> because I would want one that could be out, that could be handled and, and one that could be, you know, pristine in Mylar that we would put in the exhibition case. But um, I just, I, I liked being able to share them. You know, the um, 
Carrie's book with the with the bird wings and the horse hair. I mean, that book is extraordinary. And any time that I would touch it, it was it just felt you know like it was radiating something. <laughs> um, but you know, but you couldn't you couldn't sit down and share it with visitors. Really, you couldn't sort of leave them to explore it on their own. So I think uh, I think the the zine and comic world becoming really a, a part of the artist book world. And you you made a lot of really strong uh, selections uh, in those areas. I will say too, like we, so we met through NIMWA, through the National Museum of Women in the Arts. And one of the things I really appreciated about that collection was the emphasis you placed on, on zines and small press and having it right there, really available for everyone to, to look at and to flip through. And that isn't that those objects uh, can do in a way that some other book forms cannot. And I'm just looking at some of the questions. Um, Sarah, this is for you. Uh, I heard lots of titles for book classifications, and this is a little bit more getting into some of the definitions. Yeah. Um, can you talk more in depth about chap ver chap books versus photo books versus zines? Um, are there classifications determined by artists or publishers or historians? Um, like how these actually come about? Hmm. Um, all right. I can talk about this for the rest of the week. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, ch uh, chap, chap books, I referred to, uh, I think certainly with the Homie House Press book, chap books are, are chiefly poetry. Uh, sometimes they have imagery um, woven in them. Sometimes the construction of the, of the chap book sort of puts it on the border of artist book uh, and, and, uh, and poetry. Uh, let's see, f um, photo books, photo books and artist books, um, there are people that make make a division, and I I don't. I think uh, I think if you a, a photo book chiefly photography, um, the order is is um, typically selected by the photographer. So it is a narrative story. It is a, a progression through images, um, and um, let's see, uh, zines. Um, Chris, I might give that one to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so zines, an easy way to think of them is a do-it-yourself publication. Yeah. So the stereotypical zine can be seen as uh, photocopied, really roughly put together, um, but the importance of it or the utility of it is to get ideas and information out as uh, quickly and as widely as possible. So that idea of that class classification of distribution and reach that you wrapped up in in the last part of the of the talk is really geared towards uh, the zine mentality. Yeah, and and of course there are there are photo zines, there are poetry zines, <laughs> so it gets kind of gnarly with the definition. Um, I mean, I come from a library cataloging background. My job is to define things, but it's never that clear cut. So <laughs> it's a lot of context involved. Yeah, and we have. Another question from Stephanie Grimm. Uh, hi, Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. <laughs> um, she says, this was great. This question relates to museum library collections and thinking of the points you highlighted from Ronnie's quote, the private intimate nature of the artist books and the one-to-one -one relationship of those who make and those who encounter these works. How do you think institutions shape these relationships? Um, Yeah, I think, I think, um, I mean, I think institutions shape the relationships in, in, in the accessibility uh, that they make to a collection, sort of in the, in the openness that the institution has. I don't, I don't know. I, there, there are also sort of different expectations. I mean, I, I'm at the National Gallery of Art now, and I don't think that you would expect to maybe go into the reading room and see a, a stack of zines that you could sit down and pour through, but I certainly don't rule it out and I would love to see it happen there someday. Um, but one of the things I always wanted to do at the Women's Museum was to have, um, was to have just a cart that was dedicated to zines that was like covered in stickers that we would roll into the pink marble hallway under the chandeliers and just have people sit and look at zines in that environment. So, um, uh, and, and, that's not to say that zines are the only things that people can handle. I mean, I think uh, I think having having artist books handled by people um, 
brings them to life. I mean, you put something in a case, you can only show um, one page spread, you can only show maybe one physical configuration of a book that, that has mobile parts. Um, so I think the I think the handling and the demonstration of artist books is essential to their to their existence and their values. So as much as institutions are able to um, facilitate that, I think it I think it does a lot for for the collections and for the artists and for the public. Yeah, to a degree that like the haptic knowledge of the object, the necessity to lay hands on it and move through it is, is like a really interesting and I'm sure a complicated question for institutions that are charged with preserving and archiving some of these works. Yeah, but then there's also, I don't know, I've, I've felt um, kind of guilt, you know, as being like the custodian of these wonderful things that, you know, this many people ever get to see. So I think that the, the, more, um, the more mediated opportunities that you can make for people to, um, to enjoy these, these things, the, the better a custodian you are. I also say that my origin story as a book artist and uh, a publisher is from the special collections at Carnegie Mellon University. Mm -hmm. And walking into the space with, with their librarian Mo and showing us so many artist books and letting us like lay hands on them, um, like dramatically reorganized my brain when I was an undergrad. Yeah, they don't really make sense until you can do that, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you like me to, to facilitate the next question, Christopher? Or did you want to yeah, on? There's, there's some uh, scrolled a little bit earlier in the evening. Um, this question is from Katana. Although zine fairs might not be happening in person, the Chicago Zine Fest is still taking place online. Okay, if anyone wants to visit, that information is in the chat. Um, we did have other questions. Let's see. From Sarah Bender, or Sarah Sadler, sorry. Thinking with this idea of exchange slash interaction, do you think of the book as a kind of assemblage and that it can take into itself any number of disparate elements and can also enter into assemblages with readers, libraries, et cetera? Hmm. Um, let's see. I think, trying to get to the core of that question. I mean, I think I, if, if, this, if this starts to answer it, I guess, um, I don't know. Could you read the question one more time? Is it in the chat? Can I? <laughs> it was sent to me privately, but yes. Thinking with this idea of exchange slash interaction, do you think of the book as a kind of assemblage and that it can take into itself any number of disparate elements and can also enter into assemblages with readers, libraries, etc. Um, I will say yes, if I'm understanding this question correctly. I, mean, I think the question can go sort of one way or the other. I mean, it could, the question, I could be looking at it from sort of a literal standpoint. Um, certainly, artist books um, can be all kinds of things and made out of all kinds of things. They may have absolutely no um, uh, resemblance or understanding as, as a book. Uh, it may have simply just been inspired by the book form and then left that realm completely. Um, but then there's, there's sort of the more philosophical side of that question, which, um, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think the book, the book um, can take in anything that you bring to it just as any I mean, that's what any art does. You know, it, it takes what we, what we give it and, and gives us back something that we, that we um, relate to or don't or respond to. So, um, yeah, I don't know how much of an answer that is, but I, yeah, <laughs> I'll leave it there. We have another question from Erica, and it's actually a great question I'm interested in as well. What happens after the artist is included in the museum collection? I'm assuming they're speaking about um, the National Gallery. Are they in the collection of and receive support, or are the books purchased just like other works of art? Um, in, in my 
capacity um, buying artist books. Um, I, it's, it's tricky, but uh, necessary, I think, to distinguish between um, things that may come into the library's collection and things that come into the museum's collection. Museum collections typically have, um, uh, say, a, a work of art uh, committee that you know votes on uh, whether something can come into the collection or not. Um, it was always a great source of, um, sort of freedom and power that I had that I could um, I could select uh, and and still can uh, select for the library's collection with far less um, overhead like that. Um, and I could develop the collection in, in new areas. Um, I, I do that now in collaboration with uh, with library colleagues um, and sometimes with uh, with some of the curators to um, build the library's artist book collection in a way that um, that complements the gallery's collection, um, maybe that augments, maybe that takes it in a direction that the gallery has, maybe it's a, a an artist that they wanted to collect and they haven't been able for the gallery's collection, but I'm able in the library and maybe that maybe that would lead to something. Um, but they are, um, they are purchases, uh, occasionally gifts, and they are one-offs. So it doesn't, it, it doesn't end up being sort of a, a subscription or a support relationship between, um, between the library and the artist. Okay. Um, and I'm, I think I will ask the last question. It looks like I've gotten through all of those in the chat. Um, this question is a little bit more catered towards the current times that we're in. And I remember reading in your bio that you mentioned one of your favorite methods of sharing artists' books is to literally put them in people's hands. So given that, you know, we're all mostly working with our own collections that we've had prior to this stay-at-home order, what have you, what has been your experience with um, experiencing some of these books virtually, some that were were you knew of before or in, in some that were completely new to you? Um, yeah, it was, I mean, in this particular instance, it was kind of daunting, but it wasn't, uh, I mean, it wasn't unknown to me, certainly. Um, the um, Instagram is used a lot in the artist book and zine world. Um, I um, printed matter, uh, which is one of the, um, one of the biggest uh, supporters, promoters, distributors of artist books and, and uh, artist magazines and zines. Um, they use Instagram a lot. Sometimes it's still images, sometimes they flip through books. Um, my colleagues at the Maryland Institute College of Art Decker Library, that's one thing that they do frequently is they'll go on Instagram and they'll flip through new photo books and zines and comics. And so it's, um, I think, it, you know, it's, it's nowhere near putting something in somebody's hand, but I think that it's an established way of communicating out to a larger audience than any of these uh, objects will ever um, be able to um, meet in person. Uh, I think that I think that the book arts world, um, uh, the book arts community, is is accustomed to that. Yeah. Great. Well, I think this is certainly an opportunity for. Um, for everyone in this chat to visit our website and to check out the artists that are featured. And maybe this is a time to purchase some more books for your collection. We have a great assortment to choose from um, that vary from, you know, content related to image focused. And um, it really is a, a unique time and a special opportunity to be able to uh, build your collections out. So. We will, we will drop the, the website link and the chat once more. But Sarah, thank you so much for this evening. Um, it's always an honor to have you know, a perspective from an institution like the National Gallery of Art and someone that's worked in this, in this medium for so long. So thank you again. Christopher, thank you for your work in curating this exhibition and bringing together all this unique collection of works um, and all the artists, uh, the 30 plus artists and press houses and publishers that, that are a part of the exhibit. Um, thank you to, again, to, to Western Community Center for sponsoring our programs and, and helping us to make this happen. As a reminder, we have one more uh, program for the Velocity of the Page exhibition 
coming up and it is next Thursday with performance artist Rex who will be responding um, in a much different way that doesn't involve so much or doesn't involve verbal, anything verbal from what I understand. So it should be really interesting and we certainly encourage you to join us. Um, again, I encourage everyone to also sign up for our newsletter. We are uh, launching quite a few virtual programs in the coming weeks and months. So it's an easy way to stay updated on what's to come. Also, the Velocity of the Page exhibition is being highlighted on our Instagram and Facebook. So outside of joining us on those platforms at Rest in Arts, um, you'll also be able to hear about upcoming and future programs there. Uh, we are always looking for additional members for our, for our membership. Uh, your generous support makes a direct and meaningful impact. It helps us to fund these exhibitions and programming and to continue to carry out our mission for the community. Again, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you for all the artists that are here with us this evening. Great to see some familiar faces. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.